So, I have actually given you some sort of an introduction to pattern recognition, where I basically mentioned the uses of pattern recognition. Now, I shall be going into the mathematics. Uh, before I actually enter into the subject of pattern recognition, we need to know a little bit of mathematics, preliminary mathematics, so that we can actually use those things, use the mathematics while developing theorems or other results for pattern recognition. The basic mathematics involves some amount of matrix algebra. Uh, and uh, basics of probability theory and uh, statistics. Probability theory, statistics and uh, yes, I also assume some amount of calculus knowledge, some amount of calculus. I assume that all of you have this knowledge. Um, I assume that all of you know the meaning of what a probability density function is and I assume that you know what a Gaussian distribution is. Uh, let us just say a, a probability density function is uh, it may be defined over n dimensional Euclidean space, which I represented by R n. This is a point in n dimensional Euclidean space, this is actually a vector and uh, a column vector, it is a column vector, it has small n number of components and this belongs to n dimensional Euclidean space and uh, a probability density function P defined over n dimensional Euclidean space, P defined over n dimensional Euclidean space, it has the following properties, it is greater than or equal to 0 for all x belonging to R n and integral P x d x over R n is equal to 1. This is a probability density function over n dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, this d x it means actually d the first component if I call it x 1 then d x 1 d x 2 over d x n. Okay. So, that is just represented as d x and there is this underlying, underlying you will see at all these places this is representing column vector, it is representing a vector okay. and uh, integral p x over p x d x over the whole of r n is equal to 1. So, any function satisfying these two properties is known as probability density function over n dimensional Euclidean space. <coughs> we can actually in the course of these lectures, we can assume that we are not going into complex spaces, this basically we are going to deal with the real spaces. So, our probability density function is like this okay. and uh, now <coughs> there are many such functions like this. One such function is known as density function for Gaussian distribution or Gaussian density function, density function for Gaussian distribution or that is also known as normal density function. It is the definition is this,
the definition is this 1 over square root of 2 pi to the power n determinant of sigma to the power half exponential to the power minus half x minus mu prime prime means transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. Um, here it is written determinant of sigma to the power half. Let me, uh, I think since you have got background in matrix algebra, determinant of sigma, it need not always be positive. It can be 0 or it can also be negative, right. If determinant of sigma is negative, then determinant of sigma to the power half, you cannot write because then it becomes a complex number. And our definition of probability density function, not only our definition, it is says it must be strictly greater than or equal to 0. So, this means that necessarily this should be greater than 0. The determinant of sigma should necessarily be greater than 0. Even if it is 0, this whole quantity is not defined, right. Even if it is 0, this whole quantity is not defined. So, this should be strictly greater than 0. And this exponential means e, exponential means e, e to the power of something. Here, let us just see this x is an undimensional vector mu is this mean vector mu is what is known as mean vector it is the mean it represents the mean of the distribution mean average of the distribution and uh, this is also small n dimensional vector x is also small n dimensional vector both of them are column vectors. So, when I write the transpose they become row vectors that means this is going to be 1 by n. So, here let us look at this this is x minus mu this will be n by 1. Now, what is now this sigma? Sigma is known as there are several names for it. It is known as variance covariance matrix. Or another name for it is dispersion matrix. Variance covariance matrix or dispersion matrix. This will be n by n matrix. Sigma is an n by n matrix. So, sigma inverse will also be n by n. So, then this whole thing will be 1 by n, n by n, n by 1, this whole thing will be 1 by 1 that is a scalar. So, e power sine quantity is greater than or equal to 0, right. e power any quantity is greater than or equal to 0 and this is a scalar. So, this will be greater than or equal to 0. Anyway, I have already mentioned that the determinant of sigma has to be strictly greater than 0. Determinant of sigma has to be strictly greater than 0. Now, how does one ensure it? Uh, that let me tell you how one ensures that. First, do you all understand the meaning of dispersion matrix, variance, covariance matrix? Do you understand? Yes or no? I think I will explain. So, I will uh, explain to you what a dispersion matrix is or what a variance covariance matrix is. For this one, you need to know first the meaning of variance and you need to know the meaning of covariance. 
you need to know the meaning of variance and as well as you need to know the meaning of covariance. Um, if you have n observations x 1, x 2, x n, these are points in R, these are points in R that means, these are n values on real line. Then the mean of these n values x bar is equal to 1 over n summation i is equal to 1 to n x i. This is the mean of these n observations. Mean of n observations then the variance of these n observations the variance is 1 over n summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square. The variance is equal to 1 over n summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square. That is from every point you subtract the mean and you take the square like that you do it for all the n points and take the average of these squares that is 1 by n summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square. In some books you would find some other expression like 1 by n minus 1 summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square. In some books you will find this also, this is actually unbiased estimate for variance of the population. This is known as unbiased estimate for variance of the population this is a slightly complicated concept in statistics. Uh, let us not go into those specifics that what is n or n minus 1, let us not go into the specifics. We can just follow one of these things and uh, I would like to follow this, but if you are interested you can also follow this n minus 1 also. There will be slight differences in the actual values if you follow n minus 1 instead of n, but ultimately for the decisions uh, it is basically looking at the definition of variance in a slightly different way than if you write 1 by n or if you write 1 by n minus 1 basically tells you that you are looking at the concept of variance in two different ways. Um, there is a slight difference if we just follow one of these things it is fine okay. and uh, I am following 1 by n, but you can also follow 1 by n minus 1. 1 by n minus 1 tells you that it is an unbiased estimate of there is something called a population variance for that the unbiased estimate is 1 by n minus 1 summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square. Uh, this basically for advanced students of statistics they will use 1 by n minus 1. Okay. The advanced students of statistics they will use 1 by n minus 1. Uh, so, I am going to follow 1 by n which is what generally in the preliminary level 1 by n summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar whole square is taught okay. in the preliminary level. In the advanced level it becomes 1 by n minus 1. Okay. This is the basic difference. <coughs> now, this is about variance. Now, there is another concept that is covariance. What is covariance? In order to explain the meaning of the word covariance, we need to have two variables. Let us write the two variables as x and y. It is something like x is say height, y is say weight 
on the same individual you are measuring the individual's height say in centimeters, individual's weight say in kgs. Like that you are measuring these heights and weight say for small n number of individuals. Then you are going to get observations like x 1 y 1, x 2 y 2 and you will get x n y n, x 1 y 1, x 2 y 2 dot 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 x n y n. <coughs> now, what you do is that you just plot these n values. Now, I shall give here three such plots. Actually, these plots can look in very many ways. I am going to give examples of three such plots. In one plot, the points are looking like this. In another plot that is here, the x and y variables are such that, that x n and y n, x i i is equal to 1 to n, y i y is i is equal to 1 to n. So, these x i's and y i's they are looking like this. In the third plot, in the third plot, say x i and y i is equal to 1 to n, those points are looking like this. Uh, now, let us see. Here, this is say your x axis, these are your x's, and these are your y's. Here, as x values are increasing, the y values are also more or less increasing. So, we would like to denote this relationship by some quantity that is greater than 0 we would like to denote this relationship by some quantity greater than 0. Now, let us look at this. Here, when x are increasing, y is decreasing. So, this is a negative relationship. Here, we would like to represent this relationship by the same quantity, but that should be less than 0. Now, let us look at this. Here, whatever may be the value of x, y is more or less in the same range. So, in this case, we would like to get the relationship as something very close to 0. In this case, we would like to get it as something very close to 0. So, we would like to define a quantity in such a way that, that quantity should take positive value here, negative value here, it should be something very close to 0 here. What is that quantity? <coughs> Let us see what that quantity is. For all the x i's here, you find the average of this x i's and you find the average of this y i's also. So, probably that point will be somewhere here, probably that point will be somewhere here. So, then what I will do is that I change my axis to this. So, this point is x bar y bar. Similarly, the x bar and y bar here probably is this, 
So, this quantity is x bar y bar for this data set and for this data set probably x bar and y bar is this. So, this is your x bar and y bar. Is this clear? Now, what I will do is that take a point. Let us look at the coordinates of this point with respect to new x bar and y bar. Then for this corresponding value for x is this and the, corresp the corresponding value for x is this, corresponding value for y is this. Right. Similarly, for a point here the corresponding value for x is this and y is this. For a point here the value for x is this and y is this and then so on. Now, you multiply the x the new x and y values then what is going to happen? Note that this is the first quadrant according to the new axis this is the second quadrant, this is the third quadrant and this is the fourth quadrant. Here x s and y s they are greater than 0 product will be greater than 0. Here x s and y s are less than 0 product will be greater than 0 and here the product will be less than 0, here the product will be less than 0. Note that the place where products are less than 0 the number of such points is small, whereas the number of points for which the product is greater than 0 that is large and the values are also large. So, if you have summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar into y i minus y bar. which is actually this into this for this point, this into this for this point, this into this for this point and then so on and then you are just adding them up. And again you can have 1 by n or 1 by n minus 1. Okay. I am taking 1 by n here, this will be greater than 0 in this case. Right. Now, what will happen here? Here the points are in the second and fourth quadrants. So, the product will be less than 0. So, here this quantity will be less than 0. What will happen to this? Here the points are more or less equally distributed in all the quadrants. So, this summation is likely to be very close to 0. This is known as covariance, this is known as covariance. Okay. This is known as covariance between x and y. Okay. This is also represented as C O V, you only write the variables x comma y, C O V x comma y. Now, if you have two variables, you have one covariance term, I said that we have points in n dimensional Euclidean space that means basically we are assuming that we have small n number of variables we have small n number of variables which in pattern recognition language we call them as features okay we have small n number of features or small n number of variables so if you take pairs you have how many pairs you have n c2 pairs right by the way what is covariance of x with x 
what is covariance of x with x? It is basically the variance. Is this clear? Covariance of x with itself. That means x i minus x bar into x i minus x bar, x i minus x bar whole square, which is what is the variance here. Okay. So, covariance of x with itself is basically the variance. Okay. So, if we are in small n dimensional space, that means basically we have the number of features as small n, then the variance covariance matrix is like this. This is the variance covariance matrix. If the n features are x1, x2, xn, then the variance covariance matrix then the variance covariance matrix. of these n variables or n features, these n features this is denoted by sigma denoted by sigma is defined as is defined as yes. there are smaller number of variables i am representing them by x1 x2 xn since we are in n dimensional euclidean space there are smaller number of variables or smaller number of features and uh, those variables are represented by x1, x2, xn. Then the variance covariance matrix is this. This is an n by n matrix. It has n rows and n columns. This is an n by n matrix. The first quantity here is covariance of x1 with x1, which is nothing but variance of x1. This is covariance of x1 with x2. If you look at the definition of covariance, whether you write x 1 with x 2 or x 2 with x 1, they are the same thing. So, this is covariance of x 1 with x 2, this is x 1 with x 3, x 1 with x n, this is x 2 with x 1 or x 1 with x 2, this is x 2 with x 2 and then so on. So, since covariance of x 1 x 2 is same as x 2 x 1, x 1 x 3 is same as x 3 x 1, this matrix is actually symmetric this matrix is symmetric it is a real matrix it is a symmetric matrix and uh, it is also what is known as positive definite it is it can be shown to be always non-negative definite 
and in most of the applications it is positive definite. I will explain to you the meaning of positive definite. Probably all of you know the meaning of the word distance. All of you probably also know the meaning of Euclidean distance. Suppose you have two vectors x 1, x 2, x n. This is one vector y 1, y 2, y n. This is another vector. Then the distance between these two vectors, if I represent this vector by x, if I represent this vector by y, then the distance between these two vectors x and y is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to n x i minus y i whole square and then there is a square root. Right? This is the Euclidean distance which all of us know. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. My question is like this. Suppose, okay, let us assume that the value of small n is equal to 2. We only have vectors in R2 two dimensional space and let us assume that my the first one is representing height, the second one is representing weight. The first one is representing height and the second one is representing weight. Now, say for a person the height is let me let me just say 160 centimeters say the weight is 70 kgs this is for one person say for another person the height is say 158 centimeters say the weight is 73 kgs now you want to measure the distance between these two now would you like to apply this formula for it? You will have difficulty. If you want to apply this formula, then please note that you are going to have difficulty. What is the difficulty? The difficulty is that if you want to apply this formula, one is say i is equal to 1, you are going to have the difference between there is a centimeter value here, there is a centimeter value 160 minus 158, this is 2, you will get 2 square and here the next one is 3 square. Right? Say I measure height in centimeters, weight in kgs. My friend here, he may want to measure height in millimeters. Then what is going to happen? this will be 1600, this will be 1580, the difference will be 20 and this will be 20 square 400. Then there is a difference, I mean uh, originally I got 2 square, 2 square plus 3 square which is square root 13, whereas if I measure this thing millimeters, millimeters, then it is going to be 400 plus 9, 409, whereas the two human beings they are the same. So, the distance should not change just because I changed the units. The distance should not change just because I changed the units always Euclidean distance is not useful. Are you understanding it? Always the Euclidean distance is not useful. Then how does one measure the distance? Let us see. Um, let me write this thing as d square x y so, I am just removing the square root here, I have this, this I will just write it as x 1 minus y 1 
x 2 minus y 2, this is a row vector, I am writing 1 0 0 1 and I am writing this one x 1 minus y 1, x 2 minus y 2, I am writing 1 0 0 1, then x 1 minus y 1, x 2 minus y 2. Do you think the product of this thing is actually summation i is equal to 1 to 2 x i minus y i whole square? Multiplication by identity matrix does not change anything, right. So, it is actually going to be summation x i minus y i whole square. Now, I said that uh, just because I change the units, the value should not change, right. So, now what one, so a slight generalization of the distance is instead of 1 0 0 1, probably we write some weight here w 1 and w 2. So, that here I write w i. <coughs> this depends on the unit, the w i values will change if the units change, so that the whole thing will remain the same. So, this is a small change in the definition of distance and you may also have something more instead of this we might have w 1 1 say w 1 2 this is for the present moment let me just take w 1 2 this let me just take w 2 2. This is a I mean much better generalization of the previous one. In the previous one, I just wrote the previous one I wrote this. Now, I want this thing to give us distance, distance by definition it should be greater than or equal to 0. Now, my question to you is for what values of w 1 and w 2 this thing will be greater than or equal to 0. Now, if w 1 is strictly greater than or equal to 0 and w 2 is strictly greater than or equal to 0, then whatever may be the values of this w 1 and w 2 if they are strictly greater than or equal to 0, then the whole thing will be greater than or equal to 0 because this whole thing is nothing but w i into x i minus y i whole square and w i are greater than or equal to 0. So, the whole sum is greater than or equal to 0, but then if I write a matrix like this note that I wrote basically a symmetric matrix here w 1 1 this w 1 2 I wrote the same thing here and this is w 2 2 and this is a generalization of this. Okay. Then for which such matrices this thing will be greater than or equal to 0. I will give you one example, in fact you are going to get many many such examples. Let me just say this. This will be always, in fact, I will say it is strictly greater than 0. If, if x 1 is not is equal to y 1, or x 2 is not is equal to y 2. 
you take any x 1, y 1, x 2, y 2. If one of these properties is satisfied, then this is strictly greater than 0. You can check in your homes, you can check in your homes, you take any x 1 and y 1, x 2 and y 2. One of these properties should hold, either this holds or this holds. If both of them hold, then there is no problem. <coughs> now, this is the now I am going to write the definition of positive definite matrix A n by n is set to be positive definite. If this is an n by n matrix, okay, this is an n by n matrix. If A prime A A is strictly greater than zero for all A not is equal to zero vector. This is the zero vector it has n rows and one column. A matrix A is said to be positive definite if A prime A A, A is n by 1. So, A prime is 1 by n, A is n by n, then this is n by 1. So, the whole thing is a scalar. So, I can write greater than 0, equal to 0 or less than 0. Now, this is matrix capital A is said to be positive definite. If this is greater than 0 for all A, not is equal to 0 vector. And there are many, many such matrices. Okay. And the variance covariance matrix is uh, what is known as, let us just see, I will write another definition, A n by n is said to be, here it is written positive definite, this is positive semi definite, in some books this is also written as non negative definite it is also written as non negative definite so matrix a is said to be positive semi definite or non negative definite if a prime a a is greater than or equal to 0 for all a. Okay. If this is greater than or equal to 0 for all a and this is strictly greater than 0. Usually in matrix algebra, you would basically find this definition but you would not know or I mean generally we may not be knowing why this definition is necessary. I mean a way of looking at this definition is from the point of view of the distances. We want something like this because we wanted this distance to be greater than 0, right. We want this thing to be greater than 0. We want this distance to be equal to 0 if this is equal to this and this is equal to this, then we want the distance to be equal to 0. Otherwise, we want it to be strictly greater than 0, right. Otherwise, if, if x 1 is equal to y 1 and x 2 is equal to y 2, we want the distance to be equal to 0. 
otherwise we want the distance to be strictly greater than 0. If two quantities are same, then there is no distance, when there is a difference, then there is a distance, right. So, that is what we want to incorporate in the definition, which is that is why it is written in like this. We want some such definition and such a matrix is known to be positive definite, whereas if you include equality, then this is non-negative definite. Now, the variance covariance matrix is, it can be shown to be non-negative definite. The variance covariance matrix can be shown to be non-negative definite. In fact, most of the times it is positive definite and in the case of normal distribution, we assume that the variance covariance matrix is positive definite that is why we write it in the denominator determinant of sigma to the power half. If variance covariance matrix is positive definite, then uh, some properties follow automatically. What are the properties? Probably you are aware that the determinant of the matrix is product of its eigenvalues. The determinant of a matrix is product of its eigenvalues. Now, if it is variance covariance matrix, then uh, all the eigenvalues, because it is non-negative definite, they are to be strictly greater than or equal to 0. And if it is positive definite, then every eigenvalue is strictly greater than 0, so that the product is also greater than 0, so that you can write the square root term, determinant sigma to the power half. So, variance covariance matrix is positive definite implies every eigenvalue of the matrix is strictly greater than 0. Okay. So, this is one property that people have used extensively in the literature on pattern recognition. Shall we stop here?